Welcome to this week's episode of Being Human. I'm delighted to say I'm here with Liz Kislik. She is a phenomenon, a prolific writer, a coach of over 30 years to businesses um, of any imaginable form and ownership, family businesses, nonprofits, corporates, small business, large business. So uh, a great deal of experience and a prolific writer. If you go onto uh, the Harvard Business Review site, which I have done in the lead up to this interview, you've got articles on any number of potential challenges faced by managers and leaders. Um, so it is a delight to have you here, Liz, uh, and to um, suck up your wisdom for the next hour uh, on behalf of our, of our listeners and viewers. Richard, the one thing that is clear, I have loads of opinions, happy to share them. Let's do it. <laughs> All right, awesome. Now you're 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 a you're a sort of you're a celebrity in a sense with your TEDx talk, <laughs> coming up with nearly half a million views. Uh, why there's so much conflict at work and what you can do to fix it. I wonder if if that ought to be the place where we start. I mean, given there must be a lot of people who experience conflict right now in their organisations. Um, and uh, yeah, it sounds like you you've got a lot of experience there. So. Yeah, should we should we kick off with that? Yeah, um, sure. Why? Well, both both of those aspects of that, like why why is there so much conflict, and then yeah, uh, how, what we can do about it. So first of all, humans have lots of conflict, mm. and one of the things that's interesting about conflict is the way we label it. You know, people don't call something a conflict unless they think it's not going well. We have lots of differences of opinions all the time, whether it's the movie we want to go see or where we want to have lunch. And the fact that there are differences of opinion only seems to rise to the level of conflict if somebody's uncomfortable about it. Mm -hmm. In the workplace, there is so often a lack of clarity, a lack of direction a lack of sufficient resources or access, you know, all the things that actually go wrong for people every day at work. Mm -hmm. And those things structurally cause people to feel at odds with each other, even if they share big goals or big purposes. Yeah. So it just pops up constantly. And um, I didn't, mean to become the conflict lady, which is sort of, <laughs> seems to be one of my roles. But so often trying to work on a specific business problem, part of my role is to facilitate the conversations around that problem. Mm. And what you see is the different ways in which people take positions. If you're not in it, it's really fascinating. Right. Uh, and so just seeing all kinds of trends or threads that repeat and how people protect themselves or attack others, all those kinds of things, it was just clear that the subject needs to be addressed over and over and over. Right. Right. Um, and so it's this discomfort is the heart of the, of the conflict. It's, it's, when, it's not that there's a difference of opinions. It's when someone has discomfort around that difference. And is that is that the way in? Well, you tell me then. So how 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 do we use that insight to to, to get into to dealing with it? Okay, so um, because of your question, I'm going to address a subject that is nowhere in the TEDx, which is about people feeling safe enough to say what they think, mm. and to say what they think in a measured way as opposed to sort of strapping on their gun belt and being ready to unload because they're so fearful that no one will pay attention to them mm. or take them seriously or respect their view or their expertise or their data even. Uh, conflict gets very tied up with hierarchy in some organizations yeah. and in others, it's because the the hierarchy actually is not involved enough. Okay. It's it's like when you send siblings to play with each other and they get into mm. a spat and then one of them or both of them ask for help 
And the parent says, well, go work this out yourselves, <laughs> mm. which if we could do, we would have already done. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so, and so I guess when you're working with people then and they're in a conflict and they're, and they're feeling uncomfortable, what, what, what are the ways in which you work with that discomfort? So it depends on who the people are and what I know about them already. Mm -hmm. um, because if we already have a working relationship, then I will actually bounce around a lot between what is the content of the discussion, what are the structural norms or rules of the organization that are in place that we have to confront, and also how are the individuals reacting. Mm. Uh, with new people, I might just start with the content because they think yeah. that's where you're supposed to start. Right. But so often, if you just look at people's bodies, the first thing is just to have people calm themselves a little bit yeah. and convince their brains that although this is difficult, they're not physically under threat because mm. the brain doesn't know the difference between a physical threat and an emotional or psychological threat. And we either lock down in a kind of freeze mode or get activated in a fight or flight mode. And so the first thing is actually to recognize I'm okay. It's just Tuesday in a meeting. <laughs> you know, I deal with this all the time. Nothing really bad is going to happen. Mm. So now let me gather my faculties and see how I can do my best in this interaction. Yeah. And so I suppose for, for people listening to this, that's that's something to really consider is like how much of this experience that someone's having is their personal discomfort because they, you know, they've been triggered by the situation at some level. And how much of this is about, you know, the content of the of the difference of opinion. We and, charge ourselves up, you know? Mm. Um and people who feel we do pay attention to our histories, sometimes too much. So people who are either lower in the hierarchy or feel they have less clout or juice mm. or have experience with losing may assume losses too early. Yeah. You know? Whereas people who feel, oh, I have the authority of my office or that in some other way, I know how to manipulate this situation. Um, people who are bullies, people who um, rely on their hierarchical power too much, those kinds of things. Well, I'll just assert, which is not at all useful for resolution. Mm. It may direct behavior. Yeah. But in the long run, really stinks. Right. Okay. And so when you're when you're going into a situation like that, your 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 goal is people to presumably in as fast as possible to get out of that dis discomfort, to come into their bodies, to 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 take a breath, to to find some ease uh, before they start tackling the the content. Actually, that sounds more humane than <laughs> what I'm actually thinking which is I want everybody able to think clearly mm. and to hear what others are saying. So I don't want them so relaxed that they let stuff go necessarily. Right. You know, there is a kind of attentiveness and alertness without going all the way into hypervigilance. Mm. Because right. there's work to be done. Yeah. You know, and one of the things that makes people uncomfortable, a few things that make people uncomfortable are not just their own emotional state, but an excellent manager who thinks I'm representing a team. I have to get what my team needs. Yeah. There's a kind of real activation in that, uh, the concern about not being able to serve the people you truly care about. Yeah. That's pressure. Yeah. Yeah. So 
so I get what you're saying so well this is my interpretation you say you're not saying let's let's wish away all of the discomfort or somehow absolve it all you, 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 yeah you want to retain some of that if you like legitimate discomfort but yeah but but not at the cost of thinking clearly that's right so not the fearful discomfort yeah. not the one where you either have to close yourself off or run away but the discomfort that is motivating mm. so so it's about getting people out of the fear out out of fear as best you can often yes oh yes um which is not to say oddly that fear can, fear can be a terrific motivator. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, say there's an ethical circumstance. Sometimes a person's fear will motivate them to speak up in ways they might not have if they weren't afraid. Oh, what we're learning in this conversation is I really can't stand absolutes. <laughs> so I like there to be wiggle room. Yeah. On all sides of it, because um, when you speak in too much in in generalities, sometimes people think, "Oh, there's a way to do this. There's an an actual single way." Right. And the thing is, you can create a five step, three step, nine mm. step to almost anything, and it will work on a lot of stuff, but it won't work on everything. Right. 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 So perhaps it, it, it's more about being aware of these factors, perhaps, yes. right? Like, let's be aware that people can be at, at, at potentially have a level of discomfort, which is impacting on their ability to to think clearly. And to the extent that's the case, we might want to deal with that. Very well said. Okay, awesome. Is there anything else then that you're dealing with? You know, what what have you got your senses open to when you're when you're in there and you're you're dealing with conflict? I think the thing I would look at next is what do you really want to accomplish? There's a big difference between the position you came in with or the thing you want to represent and whatever are the shared goals and values at the highest level. Uh, I was having a conversation with a client group yesterday and they were talking about the great difficulty that happens when leaders of different departments come together. This happened to be a kind of IT related conversation, but people come in with different needs. And in setting the priorities, sometimes a leader will recognize that a different department's priorities are more important. Right. But then they have the discomfort of going back to their team and saying, I didn't stand up for us. Mm. This is rough. This is, I want to belong to the bigger team. I don't want to be shunned by my team. You know, we don't want to, most of us, we want to belong. We don't want to hurt anyone. In business, limited resources, too many goals, all the classic stuff that's happening almost all the time. You can't say yes to everything. Mm. So, you know, whose ox is gourd? And what do you do about that? So the conversation of having to go back and communicate out what you did or didn't get can cause some people to take a position that's not good for the overall organization, but is good for their team. Right. Yeah. And does that's make it easier thing. for them when they're dealing with their team. Right. So what are the biggest goals? What are your highest loyalties? People really need to examine that. But it's not enough just to do that as a single person. That kind of messaging has to extend through the entire organization so that the the norms are in place and everybody knows this is what we need and we really need it. But for example, to serve the customer, we may have to wait. Right. Something else may come first. Yeah. So in a sense, the 
conflict of the IT meeting may pale relative to the conflict of going back to your team. And they want to know, what did you do to us? Yeah. You know, how could you sell us out like that? And for some of them, it will be moral. You sold mm. us out. And they won't want to look at the overall good. Right. So there's something about context and framing of these of these conflict conflicts. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's and why we're in them all the time. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like zooming out, right? And, and uh, yeah, untangling that, from the immediate, oh, a seeming conflict, right? That's beautiful. That's one of my favorite techniques with clients. Mm. One of the things I say to clients all the time, they say, here's the problem and here's the situation and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I say, that's accurate. And it's incomplete. Mm. Because it's what we see and what we see in the moment and what we see depending on who our constituencies are. And there's always more. And how much of the more is each person responsible for? It's an interesting question. Mm. And, and that's about having an inquiry into that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is why shared vision and values are so important. Mm. Because if they really are shared, then you can refer to them in the decisions. Yeah. But if you're not, there will be more inherent conflict because you actually want different things. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Got it. And so is there an example that comes to mind that would illustrate this where you've had, you know, you one of the, you know, really difficult conflict that you you've had to go, gone into and you know, could you tell the tale a bit about how you, you know, how you got through that and to, to some resolution? I'm only going to give you composite answers, probably. But so much of it comes down to not just what the decision is. Mm -hmm. Okay, after all of this discussion, whether we come to it in a kind of group participation or a more senior leader adjudicates yeah this is the thing how do we think about it and how do we talk about it and that's where the real work needs to happen in a way it's not even the meeting itself it's what do we what do we report out or someone saying okay I believe this is the right and appropriate thing. Now, leaders at my level, help me figure out what on earth I am going to say to my people. Mm. I don't even know how I'm going to face them. That's a very vulnerable thing to do. Yeah. It's easier to ask a consultant or a coach to help frame that. Yeah. But if, say, the leadership team or the management group or whatever group it is, if everybody felt responsible for that kind of thoughtfulness and communication, I think it would add a different aspect to the decision making itself. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. So now we're, we're getting into psychological safety of groups. And I don't know if you're familiar with Amy Edmondson. She's been yes. on, on the show. and. Yes. Um, yeah, that that's so important. Of course, there's now good research that suggests that's one of the key perform components of high performance. And is that that's right? So that is that is that a part of your work then? Um, I wouldn't say that's directly the work, but it mm. is absolutely part of the work because if the individual teams really feel bad, my leader doesn't look after us. You know. Mm. That's some of the Gallup research, too. Um, they either, if they consider themselves a high performer and a star and really valuable, they may look for work elsewhere. Or if they consider themselves a run-of-the-mill, ordinary person, that kind of disappointment 
can cause an ongoing disengagement, presenteeism. They're yeah. there, they're working, but they're not giving their all. They feel too disappointed. Yeah. And that's, and that's, and yeah, and that's where teams don't feel like they trust their leaders. They don't feel their trust is, you know, they've got the support of their leaders and uh, yeah. And, and that, that factors into psychological safety amongst other, you know, amongst that's other right. things. Yeah. But it's remarkably hard work to have somebody four, six, 12 levels down from the top of the organization mm. who feels cut off from how decisions are made to get them to understand that priorities that are not theirs are actually more valuable in serving the custom. Right. They may have the capacity to understand. But putting that work in and keeping it updated, nobody accounts for that in how they spend their time. Mm. Yeah, taking that time to fill out the context of the decisions that are being made, right? Yeah. And that's the work of, you know, every day. Mm. It's a kind of phase zero to everything. If that's there and it's bedrock and it's, it's, enlivened all the time, then people feel much better even when they feel disappointed. They're not licking their wounds in the same kind of way. But I don't see it much. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that, I mean, that's interesting because a lot of the work that we do when, because we're, you know, we're in sort of similar fields is, is is context when we you know we're developing leaders it's all about you know context do do you understand the context you're in are you able to articulate that to those around you and the people who are following you it's yeah you're just you're just echoing that you know from a different angle but yeah that makes complete sense to me um but it but it feels like work it feels like effort oh god i might have to go through like that, the yes. whole you know all of the layers of context just to have a conversation about this one point yes yes um, it's so much work but it's so important, isn't it? And you can really see how that, you know, as um, yeah, as as a, as you sort of as a sort of a baseline investment in the culture, if you like, or in the relationships, right. lessens the 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 chance of big of big conflict. Because then, if you do have to make difficult decisions, you know it's going to be much easier to communicate those outwardly when people already have a very good grounding of the context for whatever such a decision being made is. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Which, which presumably, and I know which sort of touches into transparency as a theme in, in culture and in business, um, you know, is, is a big part of that. Um, good. Now, the other thing that we, you know, I, you know I, I, well, before we move on, is there anything else you'd want to touch on with regards to, so we've talked about, we've, we've, we've talked about this being sensible to discomfort in people and being alive to that and where necessarily help, helping people get out of discomfort. Um, you know, we've just talked about, you know, context and bigger picture and people having having that view and opening up around the conflict. Um, is, is there anything else you'd want to offer in terms of people dealing with conflict? I'm going to give you two more things. Cool. One is data. Um, I'll probably end up wanting to give you six more things, but let's see if we can keep it to two. One is data because so often conflict happens because we go into the discussion and there are crucial pieces of information that are missing. And I don't know about you, I do this mm. with my husband constantly, you know, we start speculating about what might be true, what might have happened, what you can just go around and round and round, mm. certainly get stronger in your positions. Somebody needs to say, oh, wait a second, we should check on this. <laughs> You know, like, let's get the real facts or the real research or what that person said. Whatever it happens to be, that can often illuminate a conflict wonderfully. So strength of opinion is nothing if the opinion's wrong. 
getting the information in the room at the time of discussion is just really important. And it's almost humorous how, as you know, grown up professionals, people forget to do that. So that's one important. Yeah, I love that. It reminds me actually, we were, I work in a co working space and we were having an argument yesterday about whether this it was a dumb argument, right? Whether this particular TV station was growing in the UK. And yep. I'm like, it's definitely growing. And he's like, oh no, it's 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 died, it's going nowhere. And the guy from my shoulder just immediately went online and found that it grown massively in the last two quarters. Yes. End of argument. Yes. Uh, this is actually one of a great one of the great uses for our phones. You know, mm. sometimes you can just look the thing up. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> and that's fantastic, whether it's in the bar or in the boardroom. Yeah. Okay, and I got so excited about that, I forgot what my other point yeah, yeah, was. Yeah, go on. <laughs> no, I forgot what it was. Um, it was data and something important, and I forget. Oh, I remember. Skillfulness. So all the safety in the world can be ruined, mm. and we do it all the time, when we're just inattentive or unskillful. Mm. and. Um, so often it is useful to have techniques, particularly if they're a kind of agreed upon set of them. This is how we'll talk about this kind of thing. Or when we notice, anyone in the group can notice that we're at a certain level of agitation and blow the whistle on it. We will always take a 10 minute break. We will always do a reconvening. Mm. behavior to bring us back together. And when an individual behaves unskillfully, someone says, not meaning any harm. Well, I don't care about that. Right. They're a totally good person. They want the right things. It just didn't strike them and they said this. That's unskillful. Mm -hmm. When you observe a colleague who is unskillful, certainly a direct report, work on it. <laughs> yeah. Explain to them the impact and give them alternative actions, alternative language. Uh, in a decent environment, maybe the most productive of these conversations is actually up with your boss mm. because unskillfulness does unintended damage. Often the person who receives the damage knows it's unintended, so doesn't want to bring it up. Right. But the fact that they understand and that they know it was unintentional doesn't mean the damage wasn't done. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. increasing skillfulness in the environment is a fabulous true work goal that I don't think people think about in general. That's a very good point, isn't it? Um, what and and what do you think about? Because I know there are certain, and we've had this on the show, is that there are are now um, sort of form, formulaic meeting styles, right? Where where you have you know you might there's the six hats right I don't know if you're familiar with that where every hat you know you okay now you're allowed to just vent and then the next round you you give constructive feedback or there's holacracy which has a similar sort of highly stylized form for for managing conflict you know what what is it, is that a way into this or is it more focusing on the skill of the individual you know yeah what's that's your view? a really good question. I would hate to give a rule for this, actually. Right. I, I really like situational analysis because it's really different in different places. And often it is tied up with levels of or beliefs about authority. Mm. Um, so. I think if there are general agreements, that takes care of a lot of issues. But individual skill can make the difference. You know, either it gets you over the line when things are tough, or 
it holds you back. So, you know, if you're going for the bell curve approach, having a structure first helps everybody be pretty much in the same place. Mm. But if you really want to be extraordinary, everybody has to be a little extraordinary. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, now I'll have to think a lot and make sure I think it's true. But I, I think that's a pretty good working model, actually. Structure to get good and then individual skillfulness to be excellent. But you can't actually neglect either at every level. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that one of the one of the ways that those can work well together is in those those structured meetings where you've got high participation and everybody is given an opportunity either to make a proposal or to to vent them or whatever it might be. And there are various you know, forms of this emerging. But it but it does both, right? It builds individual skill. Because it, it means, you know, and, and potentially from quite junior and early in people's careers, um, where you've got these formats in in place um specifically designed to surface and then deal with with conflict in an open, highly participative way. Yes. Yes. In principle, that's all great. Yeah. And it really covers a huge portion of the waterfront. And then there will always be interpersonal weirdness. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, exactly, exactly. But it, it reminds me of, um, there's a, a guy we had on the show who's one of the co-founders of a company in Argentina called Ten Pines. And they're a, um, they're an, a software outfit, right? But they, they're very flat and uh, they have, you know, a lot of a very open style of decision making. And I asked him, you know, what what does the company, um, your guy, his name is, what does, the, what does the company do for leadership development? He says, well, we don't believe in leadership development. But we have citizenship development. They think of their, their, their yeah. people as citizens. Sure. And our processes develop them automatically. Yeah, you know, because, because every day in just their daily participation in the workplace culture, they're uh, called upon to be, to be leaders, right? So right. Um, right. Uh, I thought that, that was interesting. But it doesn't negate what you're saying is because there's still another level, right? There's still individual skills that can be developed outside of what people are just going to naturally uh, develop right. through, through the culture. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, 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 so that was your two. That was, that was data, and then there was skill, skfulness. Uh, I know you said two, but I should just check. Is there, is there anything you're sort of burning? I'm stopping to, there. That's enough. You're staring at that. I love that. No, that, that that's great. Um, the other thing I wanted to get into, just because I was I was perusing your articles, and um, the, when we talked about this a bit before we came on the on the show, but the, the headline of one of your articles really caught my eye. Um, the problem with using I statements at work. And and I said to you this before, I'm like, what? <laughs> like I spent hours with my clients, like helping them to formulate in terms of I statements, to own their reactions, to own their commitments, uh, to foster, you know, their leadership uh, uh, skill and, 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 and I suppose identity as leaders. So yeah, talk to us a bit about the problem with I statements. So I agree 100% with all the ownership stuff, mm. really knowing what is my responsibility in this, what do I seek to gain from it, all of those things. Who am I in this situation? Mm. What are the meanings to me? That's really the underlying work in any human interaction. So 100%. Here's the problem. And it may be... You know, sometimes I think of my work as a kind of um, pathology. I don't mean the bad thing. I mean what a pathologist does, mm. <laughs> which is that you're ex examining things that don't belong in the body, you know, things that aren't working so that you can heal them, medicate them, whatever it is, for the greater health of mm. the organization. And... um it's possible that we work in different kinds of organizations. One of the things, so I did agree with the I statement thing years ago. Right. And, and let me just say for listeners that I statements um, really come out of the marriage counseling environment. Mm. As a way to uh, John Gottman, for example, is mm. one of the most famous of those folks. 
as a way to absolutely demonstrate I'm not attacking you. I'm talking about what's happening with me. Mm. And I'm hoping that if you understand that, because I've been skillful about explaining it, that it will actually help you understand me better. And therefore, the we will come to a better place one way or another. Right. So work isn't marriage. (laughs) I'm just telling you a big secret. And it is not a love relationship. Mm. There's money involved. And it's not usually expected, at least today anymore, to be for life. Mm. And there are usually explicit levels of power. Yeah. And what I came to observe over time was that people making I statements upward were often seen as emotional, too self-focused, and unprofessional. And this was explicitly true when the people making the I statements were women. Right. It seemed like weakness. Hmm. It did not seem like, because I understand myself and am centered and grounded, I can extend to you the full explanation for my behaviors and needs and trust you to do the same and see the same. Mm. Well, that's not a requirement in work. Yeah. And so I just saw a lot of people being unpersuasive over time. Mm. Whereas if they went in with data, attachment to shared goals and vision and values and those kinds of things, they could make a much more compelling argument. Right. Right. And and I can, I I can absolutely, I can, I can, and I can certainly see that where you've got, you'll come, especially when you're going, you you know, you're upwards and you're working into a frame where exactly those eyes may get interpreted as weakness or emotionality and so on. Um, But, but if this is about showing up as an authentic leader uh, and potentially sharing vulnerability, you know, vis-a-vis our other conversation earlier about psychological safety, is is there not still a role there for I statements? Like I I get the need to judge the, the context, but Yeah. I totally agree. There is a role because there is a potential role for I statements in any interaction between two human beings. Mm. But I think it is because you've evaluated the interaction as having personal content. Right. Okay. Leader goes first, for example. I'm making myself vulnerable in this conversation so as to level the playing field just a little bit and therefore encourage my team to share with me how they felt through the pandemic, for example. Right, yeah. That kind of thing. Um, Okay, so I'm very mixed. I didn't tell you this in the beginning. I was interested to see where we would go. Yeah. Um, I'm very mixed about this authenticity issue. Mm. My mother used to say something about not being so open-minded that your brains fell out. (laughs) Which I like that. (laughs) It's just a wonderful thing to picture, you know, in sort of cartoon form. Um, I don't think that people certain levels down should be burdened with certain aspects of a leader's whole life. Mm. The authenticity of, I had a bad morning and I know I'm cranky. So I'm letting you know that because I'll try and manage it, but I might be a little short-tempered today. I think that's useful. So long as it is not used over and over as an excuse. Mm. But explaining the depths of my distress 
about issue X might not be appropriate for someone mm. who has no power and has to listen to me and maybe even coddle me. There are so many weird things in in power dynamics that I'm I'm mixed about this. Mm. Similarly, don't you love and respect people who can, you know, sometimes just be a total pain in the ass? Yeah. I'd like them to tamp that down a little bit. <laughs> Even if it's their natural state to agree that in this context of difficult work together, we try not to subject each other to all of our natural tendencies. Right, right. Which is, I guess, it, I mean, uh, emotional dumping is a term that comes to mind, right? Good. Very good. Yes, yeah. that would be one. And especially being conscious of that if you're, or if you're the senior leader, because people just feel like they've got to suck it up, whatever. You know, th th there's going to be less, much less likely that get, people are going to be safe to say, oh, hang on, you know, take that to your therapist, right? They're just going to feel like they have to listen to you. Yes, yes. And you can off, I'm actually picturing a leader um, that I know. You can often get the phenomenon where people really feel they have to become caretakers mm. of the leader and they stop bringing the leader truths that the leader needs to know. Right. So, uh, yet again, I just don't like a unilateral <laughs> statement because there are always other factors. I agree that people should be authentic. You know what I think of? I think of candid. And with a side of vulnerability, yes. Um, and that that is authentic, but with some limp, I have very high privacy norms, I have to say, um, for myself. So <laughs> I'm mixed about this, but I think the vulnerability of a leader saying, in the population, there are many, many mental health issues. This is a real thing that we deal mm. with here at work. I myself or my beloved family member or et cetera. And so I understand how this can affect someone's day, ability to process, whatever it is. And when these things come up, it's the same as if somebody had a cancer diagnosis and needs room and space and kindness. And so the leader goes first. I'm very fond of that. Mm. Um, but I don't think all my colleagues need to know everything about me. Right, right, right. Yeah. A kind of appropriate level of discodalosia, right? Right. For the situation. Right. Was I loading too much into that, Richard? Um, for where you were going? How do you mean? Sorry. I'd, um, well, authenticity just seems like a good thing. We certainly had decades without it, and it was pretty crummy. And it is better when we have it, but I just poked a lot of holes in authenticity. Yeah. And I think, I think, I think you're right. And I, well, this comes back to skill, skillfulness. Okay. Yes. It's an intentionality because, yeah, yeah, I, I think, and, 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 and how that links to psychological safety. It's like you cannot, I don't think you can have psychological safety without some, the leader uh, kind of instituting and maintaining a norm of a certain level of vulnerability themselves yes. to give permission to others. Yes. And to, so, so you, it's almost like you can't have psychological safety without some level of you know authenticity stroke vulnerability from from the acknowledged leader of the of the group i think i think that's true right yeah. um i'm good so i think it's important and we've already established that psychological safety is is an important factor in you know and and has now been statistically proven or at least there's one case that, is, that there is a group making that claim that it's uh linked to performance um so so that's true um yeah. So I think have you poked holes in authenticity? Well, not really. I think we've just we've just established that there's a level of, you know, as with everything, right? There's a there's there's the situation, um, and there's a there's a level of appropriateness. 
I, I suppose the other aspect of it is, which um which you you touched on. So there's the I get there's the you know potential risk of oversharing and you know overdoing it, but and you said earlier, you know, business is not a family, right? But what about this this viewpoint that says we ought to be creating more heart based connections in the workplace? We ought to be able to talk about love of each other in a workplace setting. That's part of you know humanizing the workplace. That's part part of our evolution of workplace culture is allowing ourselves you know that level of expression. Um, and I'm thinking right now about Satya Nadella at Microsoft, and he gave all of his exec team you know the the nonviolent communication book, which is all about you know heart based communication. So I'm like, so it seems at least that there are certain signals that this is popular you know as in in the workplace right now. So what's your what's your take on that? I completely agree because heart-based, compassionate workplace behavior will get more people traveling together to wherever you want to go mm. and will bring out people's best. Mm. I completely agree. Um I think, and perhaps I'm biased by certain elements of U.S. business culture, there has been, as part of this sort of urge toward love at work, a lot of we're like a family here, but then mm. we're not when we lay you off. Right. Yeah. And. I think it is inauthentic to rely on family feeling, heart-based feeling, when there is a tremendous sort of inexplicable difference in pay ranges. You know, there are all kinds of structural things that fly in the face of that. We love you. But I get a special parking spot, eat in a special dining room. My bathroom is so much nicer. And I don't actually have to see you in the hall. I love you from afar. <laughs> you know, I can hold my nose. That irks me. Right. I think that's manipulative. I think... The good things about family, we back each other up, we don't leave each other behind, those kinds of things. I think you can evaluate them and see what are the aspects of those intentions that will not be wrecked by capitalism. Mm. So say you're dealing with a startup. Sometimes in a startup, people hate each other, mm. you know, which, which, oh, my God, the level of intensity, it's really fierce. But sometimes they are a social team as well as a work team, and they really yeah. do love each other. You still need both the rules and the skillfulness to be able to deal with non-performance or some kind of dysfunction. And to figure out, I don't know, can I love you into, you know, being more expert than you are? I don't know if that will work. Uh, but can my love for you help me find a way to express to you how important it is that you correct a particular skill? Maybe that will work. Mm. So I agree about what I think of as full heartedness and open heartedness. But in true love, I think there are ways you give your heart away and there's still money involved, you know? So, um, and, and rank in, in most places. And I think sometimes the family thing is used to quiet the troops. We give you parties. Mm. We give you fun. See how we love you. Um, even to the extent that in some 
um, I don't know what a good word for this is, parent-like leadership cultures. Yeah. I, I'm using that loosely. They're very wonderful. If, if an employee has a real problem, mm. the leader may swoop in and provide funding, provide professional interventions for all kinds of things. And that's really wonderful. It is not wonderful if the leader does not also then help the employee and all their employees to be the best possible in terms of their work mm. and their true ability to contribute their work to the whole. It's, it's not enough to be sort of benevolently patriarchal. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I can, I can, I can see that, right? What is it? Um, you know, account is it? Is it uh, autonomy without accountability is just a vacation, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I get that. Yeah. Um, and a kind of consistency. You know, do we mean this in all things? Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I can, I can, I can see how it gets. Uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of uh, organizations come to mind where they embrace a lot of that language, but um, aren't, right. aren't true to it, and may right. have the intention even of 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 that being consistent across the culture. But can you actually, you know, can you achieve it? Um, and yet, to your point, as terrible as it is to fire people. It is possible to do it quite well and have good relationships with them forever after. Right. And, and I think there are, I think they are, and I think they're in the minority, but I think there is a, a cohort of organizations who really do live it and, and fire correct. people in a loving way, right? I, that I, is correct. I, um, but yeah, I think you're all, what's also true is there are perhaps a lot more organizations who embrace some of this language, but find it difficult to be true to it. Right. Or they're true to it when it's easy. Mm. It's that when it gets hard, because I also need to make my numbers, um, or when it gets hard, because stop bringing me that complaint, I've heard it a hundred times already. Then they turn away from that. So I agree in principle, it's a good thing. But I think it is only really lived in a small minority of organizations. Yeah. Yeah, and I suppose what you're really highlighting to me here is like, because a lot of this, if you like this cutting edge there thinking, you might say, around um, really sort of blasting open what we consider, you know, traditional workplace culture into something that feels a lot more you know, humane and um, a lot closer to what we experience outside of the workplace uh, works in a, in a minority of organizations but might get kind of exploited in some others right and i think that's it's a really good point yeah right i mean think even if you're a small organization tight-knit founded mm. by friends and say everybody really is a skilled person if your business grows you have to hire other people can you screen well enough that people you bring in to help you run the business will actually operate the way you have operated. Mm. Can that be extended beyond the nucleus in as healthy a way as it worked? It's really hard. Yeah, 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 yeah. Unless you're, well, it's where it comes back to, I think, and I think that then there has to be this, um, this dual focus of, a, you know, a, a real, uh, commitment to a certain style of interaction, you know, that that happens consistently through meetings and peer to peer, and you know, across yeah. the hierarchy, right? And uh, yeah. but that's real work um, and time. Yeah, and time, and, and, and trust time. that all of that is going to yes. pay off in a bottom line performance. Yes, because uh, you're yeah. actually spending money on it. Yeah, that's what time uh, is, you know. So yeah, 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 yeah. Um, fantastic. Well, I know I know that we're coming up on time here. I'm I'm loving this conversation. I'm sure there's so many more <laughs> topics we could 
um, we could dive into. Well, I suppose this is, yeah, this this relates to to what you know to the to both of these themes really. Um, and you also you also wrote an article for Forbes. Um, do you want to better performance help people strengthen their relationships? So I suppose everything we've talked about is in that ballpark. Is is there anything else you would say? Uh, about relationship building in in the workplace. Oh my goodness! This is a question for the end. <laughs> if um, you had to pick one thing. <laughs> if I had to pick one thing, okay, I'm going to make this a self focused thing for the individual, mm. which is that in general. You can recover from almost anything. In work relationships, there are all kinds of things that can go wrong because of hierarchy, because of time, all the things we've talked about. There's almost always something you can do about it if you are willing to be the things we've talked about, open and vulnerable and attentive to what's going on. Um, too often, I think we get wounded once and turn away in in some way, withhold ourselves, crouch over our wound, and then don't bring the rest of us fully back into the conference room. Mm -hmm. And if we do that, work is never as good again. Yeah, that's so true, isn't it? I, yes. How many... How many organizations have kind of long standing frictions? Oh, that person doesn't talk to that person and they haven't done for the last 10 years, right? The work actually changes. Yeah. You don't feel as good about the work. Your team notices you're off. This becomes mm. pervasive. So, although I have said probably 30 things about why it's not about you and you shouldn't make it about you. Being able to tolerate something going wrong, figuring out how to heal yourself, forgive the other person, but also turn toward them and not away from them. Mm -hmm. Then you've got the hope of repair. Yeah. And if you have repair, the work can be great, better than ever. But if you don't, it actually, it won't look like it. It will look like nothing, but it ends up hurting everybody around you. Yeah. Yeah, that's, um, that's so true. And you see it, so, well, you see it so much. And well, I guess, I guess we all have opportunities to, to practice that in our, in our personal life. So when, when you're dealing with, with clients, where do you tend, and I guess this is the absolutes, but like, what are some of the things that you might consider when it comes to people, you know, they've had that conflict you know, helping them through that heal and then ultimately sort of repair phase. What what are some of the things you point people towards? Do you mean what do I do with them? Yeah, what do you do with them? Um, we talk a lot. <laughs> I ask a lot of questions and I listen for how much understanding there is of all the dynamics how much intentionality there is toward making things better. I'm looking for what do I have to work with? What's the seed or the little flame? What can I nurture into something more so that the individual will be willing, so that they'll be willing to do things that feel risky to them right now, mm. but that they might be able to practice and strengthen around as a way of going into other interactions, decisions, communications, et cetera. So where are they? What are their beliefs and perceptions? And where can I adjust them? I'm going to give you an example because it's a little strange. Um, often in coaching relationships, I find an executive team will want me to work with an up-and-coming leader who tends toward a kind of rigidity in their thinking. There's mm. good or bad. You know, it's often called black and white thinking, yeah. those kinds of things. And I made up a technique for working with a particular 
person that I now use whenever I see this. And so I offer it to you and everybody. Yeah. Sometimes it's very important to purpose, purposefully confuse the person I'm working with. Hmm. I'm thinking about Zen have, Cowens. But yeah, go on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I could yeah. not have done this 20 years ago. Mm. It would have seemed wrong and weird, mm. just weird to mm. me. But I let them develop a case about how something is, and I give them a case that agrees with them. And then I say, and now I'm going to tell you something that completely contradicts that, that is just as true. And I give them an example that has the same kind of stuff, but where they can see that the belief they held so strongly actually is wrong in this circumstance. Mm. Now, you have to be very careful how you choose your examples. They have to see that their own behavior will not serve them in this other example. Yeah. But if you confuse them over a period of time, and I always explain that this is my purpose, <laughs> they start to see that there are different ways to perceive the same circumstance. Right. And then you can grow them into seeing that is it is natural for someone else to have different views. Mm. And it doesn't make them less valuable or more inherently wrong than you are. Yeah. 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 No, I like I, I, I like that. Um giving people the right to be wrong, right? Encouraging that. Yeah. Um, that makes it, that makes a, a, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, great. Oh man. I wish I, I know that we, we, we've only got a few minutes left. I could go on forever. Um, but this, this has been uh, yeah, absolutely wonderful. Um, I, I really enjoyed the conversation. Uh, so for people who want to, uh, yeah, read more of your stuff, get in touch, you know, where, where do you, where do you send them? Um, they might as well just come to my website. <laughs> Because everything is there, all the articles, the TEDx, um, and that's www.lizkislik.com, L-I-Z-K-I-S-L-I-K. And um, they can get a free ebook there, if anybody wants that, um, that's about the interpersonal aspects of conflict. Mm. And that will also get them either my blogs or newsletter or whatever they want. Um, and they can also find me on LinkedIn, of course. Right. Great. Well, well, we'll put both of those links into the description for the show. Well, thanks again. Uh, this has been awesome. I uh, can't wait to get it out there. Uh, really great enjoyed it. pleasure. Really a great conversation, Richard. Thank you. Thank you so much.